Good morning, everybody. For those who don't know me, I'm Mal. I'm part of the team here. And uh, welcome to any visitors we might have amongst us. I wonder if you would turn with me. Let's see if I can get the technology working. Aha. Um, I wonder if you would turn with me in your Bibles, if you've got them with you, to 1 John 1, chap, uh, chapter 1, verses 1 to 10. That which was from the beginning, which we have heard, which we have seen with our eyes, which we have looked at and our hands have touched, this we proclaim concerning the word of life. The life appeared, the life appeared, we have seen it and testify to it, and we proclaim to you the eternal life which was with the Father as he appeared to us. We proclaim to you what we have seen and heard so that you also may have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with his Son, Jesus Christ. We write this to make our joy complete. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light and in him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out in the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. If we claim to be without sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. If we claim we have not sinned, we make him out to be a liar and his word is not in us. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, we thank you that you do forgive us for sins. Thank you, thank you, Lord, that we can walk in your light as you're in the light, Lord, and that, that you love us and that you have made a sacrifice for us that we might be able to have fellowship with you. In Jesus' name, amen. That word, fellowship, we like that word, don't we? It's a word that comes up a lot in Christianity. And in the ancient Greek, we have to have some Greek of the week, as Benito says. The word is koinonia, and it means things held in common. And it implies standing together on common ground. Imagine the glory of that. Standing together on common ground. What's more better than standing together, each of us, on common ground? What is better than that? Standing together with God on common ground, having fellowship with God. God desires to have a close and personal relationship with each and every one of us, where each of us stands with God on common ground. It sounds great, doesn't it? I want that. However, to so many people, that sounds just impossible. You know, so many people think that they're too bad for God. They're too bad to come to church. I've heard people say, if I set foot inside of church, I'll be struck dead by lightning. You ever heard that? Some people just think it's impossible to stand together with God on common ground. But John doesn't think so, and neither do I. In fact, he tells us exactly how this can take place. He shows how a close communion... An intimate fellowship with the Father can be the normal Christian experience instead of something we only hear about or see in the lives of other people. We can all slip and fall into sin. Who, who has never slipped and fallen into sin? I'm glad I'm not seeing any hands because according to John, if you said that, then you're making God out to be a liar. We will not find true happiness and satisfaction until situations are dealt with and sin is made right with God. When we sin, we break fellowship with God, but God loves us and has provided salvation for us. There is a means of restoring and maintaining fellowship day by day. I wasn't rostered to preach today, but Damien approached me last week and said, can we swap? And I agreed to that. But then afterwards, a few days later, I thought, something's not quite right. Has anybody had that feeling? Something's not quite right. 
and you can't put your finger on it. You don't know what it is. But something's not quite right. And it bugged me. And I was thinking and I was praying, Lord, what do you want me to share? And you know what he said to me? What have you been focusing on? And I had to go, oops. I hadn't been focusing on God. And God wanted to put that right. And I didn't feel right until I did come before God and confess that and say, I'm sorry. I didn't get that right because I wasn't focusing on you. We all have feelings like that. We all have times when we get that feeling that something's not quite right. And when we get that, often it's God saying, hey, I want your attention. I want to talk to you about something. Now, I don't claim to be any kind of expert, but allow me to share what I've learnt about how we can all experience a fullness of joy, like John's referring to in verse 4. We can draw near to God and we can remain there in sweet fellowship. But to do that, we need to recognise our sin. I had to recognise that my thoughts were not on God. I had to recognise that before I could get through there. And then guess what? God gave me this message. True fellowship with God hinges on our ability to admit sin. Now, how often have you watched documentaries on TV where, you know, like the crime stories and stuff like that, and they interview criminals? How often have you seen, I've seen this a few times, where a criminal tells that when they were apprehended and they confessed, they felt like a weight had been lifted off their shoulders. They felt relieved because they had confessed. They still face trial and they still face sentencing, but the internal guilt, that feeling something's wrong, has been lifted from them and they're feeling a lot better. God forgives sin, but we must admit it before we can be forgiven and guilt can be released. Now, the world has a few attitudes about this. One attitude is sin does not exist. But God has something different to say about that. Yes, hang on. Too far. That's all right. God says in Romans 3.23, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. How many have fallen short of the glory of God? All of us. Ecclesiastes 7.20 says, Indeed, there is no one on earth who is righteous, no one who does what is right and never sins. No one. Not one of us. Now, that sounds pretty depressing, doesn't it? Not one of us has ever sinned. Uh, sorry, not one of us has never sinned. But it's true. Only Jesus. Another attitude the world has is it's an accident of life of an evolving man. Well, that's completely opposite of what God says. We did not evolve. Remember Adam and Eve? They failed to, sh to follow God's specific instruction and devolved, which is the opposite of evolved. They devolved from the image of God into sin. They went the opposite way. But they still had to confess. Before sin can be dealt with, it must be seen as offensive to God. Until sin is dealt with, it can never be forgiven and there's no real fellowship with God. There are all sorts of self-help movements and all sorts of um, guilt treatment techniques around in the world and these are attempts with dealing with sin's guilt at a, and, and sometimes ignore that sin even exists. The world's method is that as long as sin can be treated as a mistake or a sickness or something like that, there is no need to turn for God and no need for Jesus and no need for salvation. No need for the Bible and no need for anyone to admit that they're a sinner. The world views sin very differently to how God views sin. There's a number of solutions that the world offers. Now, I'm not here to condemn any of these fields that I'm about to list, but their methods of dealing with sin are usually very much in conflict with the word of God. 
The first one, of course, is evolution. Evolution says we're at the top of the food chain. Nothing is superior to humans. We evolve through natural selection. Sin is not an issue. There is no such thing as sin. We can do whatever we like, live however we like. It's natural and there's nothing wrong with it. It's all okay. Does that sound a bit like what the world says? Education says we can be taught to live without sin. Sin is only a concept invented to control us. Science says solve the problems and mysteries of nature and we can be set free from sin. Come up with a few theories to explain everything and sin becomes redundant. Sociology says sin is merely a byproduct of an unhealthy environment which explains behaviour. Now, while that, while that may often be true, um, God is usually either ignored or seen as the cause of the problem. Psychology says talk about yourself for long enough, focus on what you need, and eventually you can eliminate your own guilt. Religion, here's a good one. Learn the doctrines, practice the rituals and do good things and you'll feel better about yourself and God will accept you. Is that how it works? No. no, no. None of these work because none of these deal with the problem of sin. After all is said and done, we're still sinners. No matter what programs we go through, we're still sinners. The only plan that works is to remove the guilt of sin and that's God's plan. Admit our sins, totally trust God through Jesus and he will remove our sin and guilt. And the best part of that is he will deliver us and it won't cost us $175 an hour. So we need to repent of our sin. If we will recognise and confess our sin to God and truly repent of that sin, he will absolutely forgive us and cleanse us. Hebrews 8.12 says, I will forgive their wickedness and remember their sins no more. Isaiah 43.25 says, I, even I, am he who blots out your transgressions for my sake and remembers your sins no more. Isaiah 1.18 says, Come now, let us settle the matter, says the Lord. Though your sins are like scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they are as red as crimson, they will be like wool. So what is repentance? Who'd like to have a guess? What is repentance? Jack? No? I thought you were saying something. Forgiveness? Yeah, okay. What else is repentance? That, Nigel? Change of mind. Change of mind. That's what we're looking for. Change of mind. Repentance is a total change of heart and mind resulting in a change of direction and action. True repentance always results in radically changed relationship with God. So how many times do we change our mind? Quite often we change our mind on just incidental things. But we need to change our mind on things that God wants us to change our mind on. When we truly repent, that is leave the sin behind and walk away. Our sin is forever removed from us and the guilt is replaced with peace and joy. We need to reveal our sins. Now, this does not mean hanging out our dirty laundry for all to see. You know, in some uh, denominations, you go to the priest for absolution and you uh, uh, admit all your sins and you say a few prayers and that's it, it's all said and done. Revealing our sins is, that's not what it's about. Revealing our sins is admitting to God that we have a problem and that we need help. It's basically putting your hand up to God and say, hey, I need help here. I've got a problem and I'm not handling it very well. And God will come and help us. It means being prepared to put right what is wrong. And that might mean that we need to talk and pray with somebody that we trust. It might mean that we need to have somebody ask us regularly, what have you been thinking about lately? It might mean that we make ourselves accountable. What have you learned in the last couple of weeks? And it might mean that we need to have some conversations and we need to have someone pray with us regularly. 
it might mean that we have to stop doing something that we know causes us to sin. It might mean that we need to change our attitudes a bit. Sin cannot undo our relationship with God, but it can destroy our fellowship with God. Remember Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden? Sin destroyed the fellowship that they enjoyed with God, but it did not destroy their relationship. They still had a relationship with God, but they weren't able to fellowship with him. Sometimes we can hide sin in our lives. If we have sin hidden and act as if everything is all right, we're what the Bible calls double-minded. James 1.8 describes someone who is double-minded. In the Amplified Bible, James 1.8 describes someone who is double-minded as unstable and restless in all his or her ways in everything he or she thinks, feels and decides. It basically means lying. Lying to ourselves, lying to others but also lying to God. James 4, 7 and 8 says, Submit yourselves then to God, resist the devil and he will flee from you. Come near to God and he will come near to you. Wash your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. When we're driving along the road and we do something silly or we go over the speed limit, what happens? Pull over. And you get, you get booked. We get a reminder, a tap on the shoulder from the long arm of the law that we're doing something not quite right. We've got an alarm in our car that prevents that. When, if we go over the speed limit and quite often you're coming up to Birkenhead Bridge and you just enter Birkenhead Bridge and it says, you are over the speed limit. <laughs> so it tells us, we have this alarm go off and tells us that we are over the speed limit. The Holy Spirit will sometimes set up, off an alarm to us or sometimes tap us on the shoulder to reveal something to us that we need to deal with. Before I could prepare this, I had to deal with some stuff. The Holy Spirit was tapping me on the shoulder. That why I, that's why I wasn't feeling like something, you know, I felt like something was wrong. It was the Holy Spirit tapping me on the shoulder and saying, hey, we need to have a little chat. And that's what happened. When the policeman pulls you over and says, we need to have a little chat, it's because you've done something wrong. When the Holy Spirit gives you a little tap on the shoulder and says, we need to have a little chat. We need to listen because he's got something to tell us. We need to take notice. God is light and light reveals error. Now, who's ever had to do something at night or in darkness somewhere along the line and you're groping around in the dark trying to do something? Does it work? Not very often. It makes the job harder. What helps? A bit of light, a torch, switch on the lights and everything becomes clear. We don't trip over things like we do in the dark. We don't pick up the wrong things like we do in the dark. And it's the same in our lives. The Holy Spirit brings conviction upon our hearts and we are forced to see sins for what they are. They are contrary to God. But in the darkness we often can't see that until God switches on some light. That can be a bit scary, being exposed to light like that. Sometimes we might feel like we're going to be exposed. We're going to be embarrassed. We're going to be on display for all to see when God shines his light on us. But let me tell you, God is not wanting to embarrass us. God is not in the business of embarrassing us. If he reveals something, we might feel convicted, but that simply means he's getting through to us. That's a good time to pray. It's a good time to confess and to ask him to deal with whatever it is that he's brought to our attention. The devil is the one that wants us to feel guilty. He wants us to feel embarrassed and he wants us to feel beaten up over our sin. But God wants to bless us even though we are sinners. God desires to fellowship with us as sons and daughters. Therefore, he calls to us in a direct fashion. 
revealing specific things to us and providing us with a means of dealing with those things. Listen to the Holy Spirit and do what he says. We need to relate our sins. So we know that confession is simply naming our sin to God specifically and agreeing with him on the nature of what that is. If the Holy Spirit is prompting us to do something, we should not hesitate to confess it and do business with God about it. It is easier to do it sooner than it is to leave it and do it later. If, if any one of us injures ourselves or if something's to do, wrong to do with our health, what do we do? We don't ignore it and hope it goes away. Or we shouldn't. We get it seen to. We go to the doctor. If we get a splinter, we get it out. If we cut ourselves, we put a Band-Aid on. We do something about it straight away. If something's not right in our spirit, we need to do something about it straight away. We need to treat it the same way as we would our body. We need to deal with it. A true spirit-filled life is not a life that is sinless. It is a life lived in close fellowship with God. And if we learn the principle of confession, we will live more consistent lives. And the last thing to today is we need to rest in the Lord. The best news for us as Christians is that there is a place that we can deal with our sins a place where our guilt can be exchanged for peace. We're looking for such a place and Jesus offers it freely to us with his blood. Jesus is the answer. One John one nine says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just and will forgive our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. He is faithful and just and he'll forgive our sins. He always forgives and cleanses, no matter how often you come. You could go to God every minute of every day and he will still keep forgiving you. He will receive you and cleanse you. He also forgets. Psalm 103 verse 12 says, As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. If somebody's travelling east, can they ever travel west? Only if you turn around. If you're travelling north, you'll get to the North Pole and then you'll start travelling south. But if you're travelling east, there is nothing except turn around that you can do to travel west. North will turn into south if you go far enough, but east will not turn into west if you go far enough. So as far as the east is from the west is as far as he has removed our transgressions from us. He blots out our sin and declares us not guilty. He will never hold it over us again but only if we come to him with it. He will do it for whoever asks. Matthew 7, 8 says, For everyone who asks receives, the one who seeks finds, and the one who knocks, the door will be opened. John six thirty seven says, All those the Father gives me will come to me, and whoever comes to me I will never drive away. Matthew eleven twenty eight says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. Revelation twenty two seventeen says, The spirit and the bride say, Come, and let the one who hears say, Come. Let the one who is thirsty come, and let the one who wishes to take the free gift of the water of life. Musicians, would you please come back? The first and primary step towards fellowship with God is the admission of sin. 
Nobody, not one of us, can save or cleanse ourselves. We can't do it. Jesus has already done the work. He simply asks for us to respond to him by faith. When we do, we will be received, forgiven, cleansed and in fellowship with him. Is that what you want? Do you want to be clean, forgiven, received and in fellowship with him? If this morning you feel that you need to do business with God, come to him now and get it done. Don't wait. Don't hesitate. Don't hang on to things. Let God deal with it. God wants us to come to him this morning and have a chat. He's got some things to talk to us about. Maybe you've wandered away and maybe you're carrying a load of guilt. There's no need to do that any longer. Jesus wants to relieve you of that load. Maybe someone here has never trusted Jesus to do what he said he would do. Please don't miss out when God has made a way that you can freely and eternally be saved from your sins. If you want to walk in fellowship with the Lord, you can, but you have to accept his invitation to deal whatever issues are giving you a hard time. If there's anybody here this morning who would like some prayer, please raise your hand. Perhaps we can all stand so that it's not so conspicuous. And those who would like some prayer, please raise your hand and some others around you could gather around and pray. You don't have to tell them what it is you want them to pray about. It's between you and God. But perhaps some people can stand with those who've got their hands raised and pray with them. Thank you, Lord. Musicians, can you lead us in a song?